not going to criticize Oscar. They are putting in place the test as it exists. Thank you. That ends the uh, question time. Next side to business is a statement by Keith Brown on the future of Scotland's railways. The ministers will take questions at the end of his statement and there should be therefore no interventions or interruptions. And I'll give a few seconds for people to get themselves settled. Minister, you've got 10 minutes. Hey, thank you, President Officer. I'm grateful to the Parliament for the opportunity to make a statement on the future of the ScotRail franchise. Yet this morning, I advised Parliament that the procurement process for the ScotRail franchise had been completed on time and to plan. The Scottish Government believes good public transport improves the lives of the people and the economy of Scotland. And following extensive consultation, Scotland's Railway has attracted a world-leading contract to deliver for rail staff and for passengers. The competition has been evaluated rigorously on the basis of the most advantageous balance of quality and price for passengers, staff and taxpayers. And the Scottish Government intends to award the contract to Abelio Scott Rail Limited. The new franchise contract confirms the Scottish Government's commitment to transform Scotland's rail service. The new Abelio Group UK headquarters will add 50 new jobs to the 150 Abelio Scott Rail HQ jobs secured in Glasgow. The franchise will commence on the 1st of April 2015 and will deliver investment in the service for the next 10 years, investment for the benefit of passengers, for staff and for the taxpayer. And the improvements this contract secures will be felt right across the network for the benefit of all of Scotland. Before I go into detail, I wish to remind members of the context of railway franchising. As members will recall from my statement earlier this year on the award of the Caledonian Sleeper franchise, Franchising is a requirement under the Railways Act 1993 and precludes any UK public sector organisation from bidding to operate a railway service. As I've stated publicly on many occasions, it's an unfair restriction that ought to be changed so that private and public bidders can compete equally. I've written to three Secretaries of State for Transport requesting a change in law and each request was refused. The Labour Administration, over 13 years, despite ample opportunity, chose not to widen access to rail franchising to UK public sector organisations. The Transport Act 2000 and the Railways Act 2005 are silent on this issue. In fact, the Labour Administration supported franchising and its restrictions. In 2009, the then Secretary of State for Transport, Lord Adonis, reassured the Transport Committee that, and I quote, the evidence so far is that the franchising system has continued to prove its worth. I'm left to deduce both through its legislative silence and its vocal support for franchising that the Labour Administration was clearly happy to leave us operating these patently unfair procedures. This week we have started laying the tracks of the Borders Railway presiding officer, but the tracks of the franchising process was laid by the Tory and Labour governments at Westminster. Earlier this week I was asked to cancel this franchising process. Doing so may have left us liable for bid costs in excess of £30 million from our five bidders. And remember, it cost the DFT over £50 million for the West Coast franchise failure. And it was, in fact, Ed Miliband who said, it's a disgrace that it's going to cost £40 million plus, and perhaps more, for the taxpayers' money because they have bungled this franchise. Nobody in this chamber, presiding officer, can guarantee what new powers we will get and on what date. But we do know that a delay in this process would be for a number of years. It would be costly and a bad deal for the travelling public. And I'm not uh, willing to put at risk the expectations of our passengers or the interests of the taxpayer by playing fast and loose with real franchising. Yeah. Despite having to adhere to unfair franchising rules, we have always stated that we would do so competently. Accordingly, we set out a prudent programme for our franchise procurements with a process managed by an expert team within Transport Scotland. We delivered the Caledonian Sleeper franchise on schedule and today, applying the same competent, prudent approach which has become the hallmark of this government, we have delivered yet another successful outcome. Following a pre-qualification process, we attracted five high-quality bids. These bidders, each with international interests, demonstrate the global appeal of Scotland. Their participation demonstrates the confidence they have in Scotland as a place to conduct business. As members will know, ministers play no part in the evaluation of bids or in the selection of the winning bidder. Those matters are governed by the process administered by Transport Scotland officials. 
However, I am advised that each of the bids was of high quality, and after a rigorous evaluation exercise, a BLEO came out on top. At this point, I'd like to thank uh, Presiding Officer Arriva, First Group, MTR and National Express for their participation and their confidence in the Scottish Government's vision for ScotRail. I also thank those many stakeholders that informed each of those bids. A particular thanks, of course, go to First Group and its hard-working staff for their management of the service since 2004. Since that time, patronage has grown by a third. We've seen over 200 additional daily train services. Performance has improved from 87% to nearly 92%, and passenger satisfaction has risen to 90%. And these, taken together, are commendable achievements. Our franchise specification puts passengers' interest at the heart of the ScotRail service, with ambitious service standards and an emphasis on quality and effective operation. And the new franchise will transform the passenger experience with improved provision of information, enhanced websites, a price promise to provide the best value ticket, as well as a Scotland-wide extension of smart and integrated ticketing, making travel simpler and smarter. And in addition to its price promise, the new franchisee will implement our commitment to bear down on fares to make rail a much more attractive travel choice. As of January next year, peak fares will be capped at RPI, and off-peak fares cannot increase at a rate greater than RPI minus 1%. Job seekers and the newly employed will also benefit from reduced fare schemes. In short, fairer, affordable fares for all. A mobile ticketing application will enable passengers to buy tickets, to search for travel information, to book cycle hire and taxis from selected stations, and to obtain details on less busy services. Enabling choice and making journeys easy is a key to getting our country on the move. And across the network, there'll be more car parking spaces, more electric car charging bays, and more cycle spaces, and even at selected stations, a bike and go cycle hire scheme to enable end-to-end -end journeys. Now, our station environments will be updated with more platform shelters, more refreshment kiosks, and major enhancements at Aberdeen, Perth, Stirling, Motherwell, and Inverness. All of this builds on the substantial investment already seen at Waverley and Haymarket, and the improvements planned for Glasgow Queen Street and Dundee. We all recognise the need for greater transport integration to join up journeys, and at selected stations, cross-modal information screens will display arrivals and departures of other modes, such as bus, ferry or air. And a key aspect will be forging links with other providers to unlock journey opportunities across Scotland. Uh, this franchise will also deliver improvements on our trains, increasing the attraction of rail travel. Uh, with high-speed trains, better journey times and more comfort, our seven cities will be linked by proper intercity rolling stock, more in keeping with the intercity experience, which we know passengers prefer. New electric trains will be delivered for Edinburgh to Glasgow and Stirling, Alloa and Dunblane services. Overall, there will be a 23% increase in carriages across the network, and that will ensure the full advantage is taken of the government's substantial investment in infrastructure. We also ask for proposals to capitalise on the tourism potential of our railways. And the new franchisee came forward with the Great Scenic Railway of Scotland, a proposition which covers the West Highland and Kyle lines, the Far North Line, those serving Stranraer and Dumfries, and from September 2015, the Borders. And this proposition enables our railway to market Scotland's scenery, its heritage and its tourist attractions to a wider audience. Trains on these routes will be refurbished and will be dedicated tourism ambassadors trained to visit Scotland standards to provide information on attractions, history and journey connections. And I hope that community rail groups and local businesses engage with the franchisee to grasp the very real opportunities arising from this marvellous, expansive initiative. I've also been very careful, though, presiding officer, to ensure that the interests of ScotRail staff are addressed in the new franchise contract. Accordingly, we work with the rail unions to ensure that staffing issues are appropriately covered, and I'm grateful for the union's assistance in that respect. The transfer of undertakings protection of employment regulations 2006, of course, will apply, and pensions will also be protected. We might be obliged by Westminster to franchise, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't get the best deal for staff anywhere, as I believe we have. The contract contains commitments on apprenticeships, 100 of those, training and staff development, and for the first time, trade union representation on the board of the company. Yeah, yeah. It also sets out the franchisee's extensive corporate social obligations to the community it serves, and the latter is important because a railway does more than just provide a journey opportunity. It also spreads and generates economic vitality and prosperity across communities. And that's why, presiding officer, this contract is a good contract. It does more than simply provide rail services. It seeks to help get Scotland on the move, on the move economically and on the move socially. We also have struck a deal with the franchisee to ensure no compulsory redundancies during the entire life of the contract. 
Over and above that, we've also struck a deal to make sure that every single person, whether directly employed uh, or through subcontractors, will have at least the living wage as a salary. Presenting <laughs> officer, we are committed to delivering a safe, a, a well-founded, a properly resourced and also an audit uh, process which makes sure that the franchise process that we've gone through stands up to scrutiny. It's also been our intention to make sure it's the best possible deal for fair payers and passengers. I believe we've achieved that even though we're obliged to go down through the franchise route. It does offer a better Scotland offering improved services to rail passengers, whether residents or visitors, security for our railway staff and enabling economic opportunities for all in our cities, towns and rural communities. Thank you. Members who wish to ask a question of the Minister should press the request peak button now and I first call Mark Griffin. I'd like to thank the Minister for notice of his statement but regret that announcements continue to be made outside of this Parliament in advance. I'd also like to put on record our appreciation of the work done by staff in the past 10 years on the franchise. In awarding the ScotRail franchise to Abellio, the Minister has decided that profits from Scotland's rail services should be, used to invest it, should be used to invest in lower fares and better services in the Netherlands rather than here in Scotland. We now have a minister who claims to support a Scottish public sector railway, continuing with a franchise tender process that excluded that very option. Why do you say one thing in your deputy leadership bid, but do something else in your position as minister? Keith Brown should have welcomed calls by transport unions and Scottish Labour to suspend the franchise process so further devolution could allow public bids to operate Scotland's railways. Instead, he carried on regardless. The Deputy First Minister recently wrote to the UK Government to ask that the rollout of universal credit be postponed to allow the talks and additional powers to be carried out in good faith. Why does the Government say one thing when they're making demands but the opposite when they're in a position to act? The Minister shows the Scottish Government's record is one of hollow words and broken promises. In public, the Government talk about more powers, but when they have the opportunity to act, they abdicate responsibility. Why did the Minister not show the leadership the people of Scotland expect and allow the possibility for a Scottish public sector rail operator to bid for the franchise? Minister. Uh, I believe that uh, that statement we've just heard shows why the Labour Party, far from being taken as a serious potential government, is not even taken as a serious potential opposition anymore. Uh, first of all, I struggle to understand exactly what the Labour Party's position is, because we have George Fuchs saying that a, explicitly the situation is we have the powers to nationalise the railways in Scotland, which is patently false. We also have the situation where the Labour Party for 13 years had the ability to change this and refused to do so. We've also got the endorsement of the franchising process from prominent Labour politicians as well. And interestingly, maybe the idea is that something's changed. Well, as recently as a few months ago, the Labour Party's own uh, publication, Powers for a Purpose, says that uh, the Co-op Party report they refer to argues for a new approach which Labour supports, which would, in the longer term, i.e. after the end of the new franchise starting in 2015. The Labour Party is all over the place in terms of franchising and the reason why we're hearing such uh, thunderous uh, accusations is because they're embarrassed about the fact we've ended up here. And you ask why there's a Dutch railway company, a publicly owned Dutch railway company. Well, that's a natural consequence. If you set out legislation which allows public bids from other countries but refuse to allow it from uh, Scotland or the UK, this is the Labour Party's legislation. The Labour Party... The Labour Party have laid the tracks for how we have to do the franchising. I very much hope that changes. We'll continue to argue for the change. And Mark Griffin says I've said one thing and done another. I've three times written to Secretary of State for Scotland arguing for that change. I would like to have had Labour support in doing that. If we've not had that support. If you want to change it, you had the chance. I don't dispute where the trade unions come from in relation to this because they've always held that position. They've never had the potential to change it. The Labour Party has and they refuse to change it. You should take responsibility for the outcome of these consequences. But we've run a proper process in this regard and we've got a good deal for the people of Scotland. Alex Johnson. 
I thank the Minister for his statement and for advance sight of it. As a North East MSP, I am naturally sad to hear that the Aberdeen-based First Group have lost out in their bid to retain the ScotRail franchise. It is no coincidence that their tenure has seen a dramatic reversal in the decline of rail passenger numbers in Scotland. Their investment and sound management has delivered significant improvements in comfort, punctuality, as well as substantial, a substantial increase in the number of routes and capacity across the Scottish Rail Network. The competitive nature of the franchising mechanism has played a key role in reviving rail transport in the United Kingdom, and I believe that the announcement made by the Minister today has uh, further strengthened that recovery in Scotland. Nevertheless, the Transport Minister has done well to resist calls from the sirens of the extreme left who would see us return to the investment vacuum and the catastrophic management failures of state-owned monopolies in the 1970s. Oh. Keith, Keith Brown, however, must guarantee that he will play his part in making this franchise a success. So I ask him if he will give a sound undertaking that he will stand by the contract he has signed and will not exploit any five-year break clause in an inappropriate way to end this contract before it delivers everything it has the capacity to do. Minister. Uh, well, can, first of all, if I can agree with the comments uh, of Alec Johnson in relation to First Group, I think they have done an excellent job and we have seen real growth in terms of patronage. So uh, we certainly uh, concur with that. I can also say that I don't share his enthusiasm uh, for franchising, as he well knows. I believe it's an expensive process to go through. It's expensive for the companies involved. Uh, and certainly just now it presents an unequal playing field and not allowing public sector bids to come forward. I've argued that uh, for, for quite some time. Uh, Alec Johnson also asked about the situation with the five-year uh, break clause which is in the contract. And that break clause can be activated by either side, either by the government or by the company themselves. And they can do so for any reason. But there is no way that I would intend for inappropriate reasons, as he calls it, to exercise that break, break clause or to exploit the break clause, uh, as he's mentioned. But that break clause has been put in there because circumstances can change and we have to be wary of that fact. All the tenderers for the contract knew that at the time. Uh, but he also asked, will I be supportive of and continue to support the progress and ambitions of this contract? Well, of course I will. I think there are huge benefits in this uh, 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 contract. And it's been the, the result of very hard work done by Transport Scotland officials. And also, I think, by the government laying out exactly what our expectations were, whether it was for cyclists, whether it was for fare payers who say they do, are suffering, especially throughout the rest of the UK in terms of high fares. We've taken action on that already. We're taking further action. And I'm sure that Alec Johnson will be very interested, for example, in the £5 fare uh, from Aberdeen to Inverness or to Glasgow or to Edinburgh or Dundee. Uh, of course, it's a, a fare which you have to apply for in advance. There are restrictions to it. But this does address the, the fact that some people want to have the cheapest possible fare. So I would hope that uh, rather than some of the comments that have been made already by Alec Johnson, he, like me, will be fully behind the success of this contract for the benefit of passengers and for the staff that are going to deliver those services. Thank you. I have very many people who wish to ask a question of the Minister. If we could have a short question and a fairly short response, that would help us get through. Stuart Stevenson, followed by James Kelly. Uh, Presiding officer, can I welcome the substantial staff improvements and new jobs that come with the new franchise, the living wage, trade unions on the board, 100 new apprentices and the protection of pensions and travel rights. Is it not the case that we must move ahead urgently to deliver for staff now, rather than have them wait for years, perhaps forever, uh, for new railway powers to come to this parliament. It's simply not the time to put Scotland on hold, especially for an indeterminate period. Minister. Uh, I think Stuart Stevenson is exactly right, and it strikes me that people like Mark Griffin really have to try and get over the fact that they were on the winning side in the referendum. <laughs> you know, power over these things rests at Westminster. There is no guarantee over powers. I don't know whether they've signed a petition to make sure we get extra powers, but there's no guarantee for powers. The delays that could be incumbent if we were to delay or cancel this contract would have an impact on the new trains which we're ordering, would have an impact on fares, the benefits of the new services and the reduced fares would not apply, and of course the enhanced benefits, as Stuart Stevenson rightly points out, for staff. 
No compulsory redundancies during the whole term of this contract. The living wage for every single member of staff, whether subcontracted or a direct employee. These are real advances uh, for the people uh, serving the, the customers and for the customers, customers themselves. And I think people in Scotland will be interested in the opposition of the Labour Party to this material advance for fair paying passengers and for the staff that provide those services. James Kenley, followed by Alice McInnes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the Minister, in the light of this decision, which takes the prospect of public, uh, public running of the, the railways out of contention for 10 years, does the Minister still support the pitch he made in launching his deputy leadership in support of public railways? And will, and will, will he then include it, will it then be included as part of the SNP's proposals to the Smith Commission? Minister. Oh. I, I don't know whether. Be in the Labour parties. Uh, I'm not sure how. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Uh, Minister. Mr. Minister, I'm aware that James Kelly came into the chamber late. I don't know whether he actually heard my previous responses, but he may have missed out the fact that it was Labour's own position. Labour's position that we should look for a new approach after the end of the franchise we're about to sign. So that's the same as the position he just outlined. It is the case that the Labour Party are all over the place in relation to this. They're not being taken seriously because they've changed their position so often. They were the party that were happy to have franchising. We've heard franchising referred to in glowing terms by Lord Adonis. You never changed it when you had the chance. You never changed it in the Calvin Commission. You never changed it in the Scotland Act. You didn't even argue for that change. So a few months ago, you're arguing for us to let this contract, and suddenly it's changed, and it's because you're embarrassed by your failure to act in the past. Yeah. We have acted to protect fair yeah. paying passengers. Alice McInnes, followed by Murray Watt. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Abellio say there will be major investment in concourse and retail development to improve links between Aberdeen Station and Union Street. And I expect this will be welcomed by people in my northeast region. But can the Cabinet Secretary tell me the anticipated cost of that project? Sorry, the Minister. <laughs> tell me the anticipated cost of this project and the timescale and some assurances that there will be thorough community consultation on the project. Minister. Well, I'm more than happy to give the assurance that there will be thorough uh, community consultation. It does involve, obviously, different parties because it involves infrastructure as well and local authority partners as well. So I'm more than happy to provide in writing the details in terms of cost, the different parties involved, and to underline the reassurance I've given in terms of community consultation. Maureen Moore, followed by Jamidi. Presiding officer, can I welcome the commitment for staff set out in the new franchise contract, which will see all staff and subcontractors paid at least the living wage, 100 new apprenticeships, uh, and the guarantee of no compulsory redundancies throughout the lifetime of the contract, as well as staff pensions and travel rights protected, uh, and the representation on the board. I think that's fantastic. Does the Minister agree that it is essential that rather than putting Scotland on pause, these key benefits for staff should be delivered at the earliest possible opportunity? Minister. Maureen Watt is quite right, and they will be delivered at the earliest possible opportunity. I think the one thing that surprises me is I've not heard one word of welcome from the Labour Party for these key benefits for staff. Sorry, Jamidi, followed by Neil Bibby. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In keeping rail fares affordable in Scotland, can I ask the Minister what difference the £5 intercity fare and reduced ticket prices for job seekers and those newly in work will make to the people and economy of Scotland? And can he set out a timescale for the delivery of more cycle spaces at stations and on trains and the introduction of a bike and go cycle hire scheme? Minister. In relation to the last point that Jimmy D makes, you'll be aware, of course, we've started that process already. I'm uh, very pleased to, in, in my own area to have launched the, the bike hire scheme and bike shop at the Stirling station just outside my constituency and also further benefits in terms of uh, the work of Recycle Bike, a tremendous local organisation which repairs and provides bikes at cheap cost to local families. So that work has started already uh, and is ongoing. Uh, and as the other part of Jim Eady's question, in relation to uh, the, the new services, they will start, of course, when the new uh, contract takes over the franchise, which will be in the 1st of April uh, next year. Um, and uh, the point about uh, cyclists, of course, is also something we'll get more information out in due course, but what the intention there to do is to make sure that people are able to park their bikes more easily at stations and also where they can to take them onto trains in greater numbers, which we've had a real demand for. So I think these are real advantages, which will mean that we can have a much more integrated element towards uh, transport. I mentioned also the fact that some of the uh, concourse improvements and signage will also tell people about ferry trains 
train, uh, ferry arrivals, uh, about bus arrivals, trying to make sure that buses, um, uh, we've obliged the, all the bidders to look at this when they made their bids, buses connect far better with rail, rail services rather than leaving five minutes before a train arrives. So all these things are benefits which we should start to see. We're seeing some of them already and we'll start to see them more in the months to come. Neil Bibby, followed by Aileen McLeod. Delivering the living wage through procurement is a good thing. It's a shame you didn't think that a couple of months ago when you voted against it, Minister, um, in the procurement bill. Since 2008, ScotRail has made £100 million of profits, 95% of which have gone to shareholders. Can I ask you, Minister, what are the projections for the profits to be made by the new franchise holder? How much money will be taken out of the Scottish Rail Network and not reinvested in the Scottish Rail Network? I don't know whether Neil Bibby is aware, but it was the Labour government in 2004 that awarded the franchise in the first place to ScotRail. Um, it was a franchising framework which the Labour government had in the past. So if he has a concern about the profits as he sees it, and we do have within place provision to make sure if there are excess profits, it comes back to the government. So we've done that. Um, and we've done that also in relation to the new contract as well. And the second point, his late conversion to the idea of the living wage, which Labour did nothing about when they were in uh, power. What we're seeing... What we're seeing is there was, no living, there was no living wage in 2004 when the Labour Party had a chance to do it. This is a government which has taken action on living wage, not just for directly employed people, but by people employed by subcontractors as well. We are taking action where Labour only talked about it. Ailey McLeod, followed by Alison Johnson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. In welcoming the announcement of a Great Scenic Railway of Scotland scheme, bringing more tourists to the south west, the borders, and the north, can the Minister outline the benefits that will be delivered for my constituents in the south west of Scotland? Minister. I think that's a very good point. I know that's been already warmly welcomed by tourist organisations across Scotland because there's real pride. As Aileen McLeod knows, not least because in her area we've had the first community rail partnership established, there is real pride in sections of the railway which we want people to take ownership of. So what we will see, as I've mentioned already, are the tourist ambassadors, which will help people to locate and get to the attractions which we have and the scenery which we have all around Scotland. That should benefit places across the whole of Scotland, including the area that Aileen McLeod represents. Thank you, Alison Johnson, followed by John Mason. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to inform the Chamber of Hospitality provided to me by Abellio during the Commonwealth Games and my position as co-convener of the cross-party group on cycling. There's a huge public appetite for bringing rail back into public hands. Green colleagues in Westminster are leading a bill which would allow the renationalisation as franchises run out. Can the Transport Minister confirm that the optional five-year breakpoint in this franchise will allow a Scottish public sector operator to make a bid at that point, providing, of course, that power is devolved from Westminster to allow it? Minister. I think the key sting in the tail is the last part of Alison Johnson's question, providing that Westminster allows the powers to do that. And of course, we're going to argue for the maximum possible powers over the rail network in Scotland. We've done that uh, for many years. We've uh, argued for the franchising process itself to be expanded to allow public sector bids. There's no guarantee, of course, a public sector bid comes along or that it's successful, but we've argued for that. In relation, once again, to the five-year uh, break clause, I've mentioned that already. What we do is exercise that only in the responsible and appropriate way. And who can say in five years' time what the situation is? But I think we have to go into these contracts with the intention of seeing through the contract. If circumstances change, either for the party providing the service or for the government, and of course you have to look, that, look at that again. But you have to go into it with the intention to have the contract. That's what bidders who are bidding for this process, as we're obliged to do, uh, expect. And that's the way that we'll follow proceedings in terms of the five-year break. John Mason, followed by Ken McIntosh. And there seems to be quite a lot of good news uh, linked to this contract from what I can see. Can the Minister confirm that as well as taking on the uh, first uh, ScotRail staff in Glasgow, they're actually going to bring new staff to Glasgow and have a new function there? Hi. The uh Again, a very good point by John Mason. Uh, what uh, Abelio intend to do is to bring their UK headquarters to Scotland in Glasgow. And uh, with that, there'll also be a shared services centre. And in total, we're talking around 200 jobs. So major benefits in terms of that. And I think that shows the level of commitment which Abelio have uh, to this process. Uh, a real boost for people uh, in terms of uh, jobs, but also, as I've mentioned, the point about job seekers in the past. The idea of making it easier for job seekers to get around the country and the newly employed perhaps before they even start receiving a, a wage, uh, to be able to get around the country more cheaply. And I think that shows and demonstrates the government's commitment to driving up employment and to helping out some of the more uh, disadvantaged people in society. Ken McIntosh. 
Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I ask the Minister if he can tell us uh, his Government's position, rather than his views on Labour's position, on whether uh, he considered using the powers that already exist within this Parliament to consider either a cooperative, a mutual or a not-for-profit franchise, as, for example, proposed by the Real Union, ASLEF, or by the Co-op. And further to Alison Johnson's question, whether or not the five-year contract break would allow a future administration to go down that route, or are we committed to a 10 years of Scotland's privatised railways? Minister. I think I've answered the question of the five-year break twice now, uh, which is to say that, of course, the five-year break can be exercised uh, by uh, either party in relation to that. Uh, Ken McIntosh's other point about the not-for-profit uh, bid, we have said from the very start of this process we'd be more than happy to see a not-for-profit bid come forward. Some of the organisations which he mentioned were very interested in that and were also asked if they wanted to come forward with a bid, and they said they were unable to do so. It's also, if he checks into it, one of the provisions is that you have to have some background and experience in providing real services, which we have at least one organisation, public sector organisation in Scotland, that's able to do that. We are not able to favour one bid over another. I think Ken McIntosh actually knows that fact. Uh, but of course, we've always been ready to welcome any not-for-profit uh, uh, bid. It didn't come forward. Thank you. That ends the statement from the Minister. Uh, can I apologise to the two members I could not call, uh, but the motions this afternoon are extremely tight. So the next item of business is a debate on motion number 11114 in the name of Graham Pearson.